at that time, you probably had most of your income was disposable, though, right? I mean, because you had this apartment you shared with two other guys, a car, and then that's it. No, that's it. no wife, no kids, nothing. I mean, you just drop it. What, what are you spending your money on? Australian Beach Club. <laughs> <laughs> so that's is that it. place still open or what? <laughs> no, did you saw that chick's in the bar. Yeah. Yeah. Chick's I don't want to be a product of my environment. I want my environment to be a product of me. Prestige Living Podcast. So with that, who do you want to be? Hello, Happy New Year. Welcome to Prestige Living. This is Jay O'Brien, your host, here with your co-host, Jordan Wilson. Hey. And Kane German. Hola. And I am very excited to have the guest that we have today because this is kind of a long time coming, I feel. And um, he is my go-to guy in the industry that we work in. He is the area manager. He's basically the man behind Citywide Home Loans in Orange County. And we're going to talk a little bit about the loan side, but just more than that, just the entrepreneurial spirit and the past and everything that's gone on to to kind of inspire and motivate the people listening to this. His name is Dino Katsiametis, and he's with us today. Welcome, Dino, to the show. Thank you, Jay. Thanks, Thanks, for, Eric. Eric. Up, Thanks for saying my name the right way. Yeah, you, you got Katsia it. Matisse. That's it. Kane, Katsia Kane's Matisse. a little better at it. <laughs> oh, really? Is that is Just that right? a little. Okay. I, I have to. He's a more sensitive, so I just have to say that, though. Got it, got it. Well, I spilled mm-hmm. coffee all over myself right now. <laughs> well, I should have got water all over myself. <laughs> okay, so um, I remember we were we – were, I think we were out to dinner, out to lunch or something like that, and you were telling me this story when you were a teenager – and you had started your, it was your first business, basically, right? Depends, which one are you talking about? My well, first business Not the was, drug one. No. Yeah, and that one's hush hush. Based, based on, not what can we not either. talk about? Yeah, based on a true story. Now, you asked me what my first business was. It was, it was I used to go to uh, whatever thrifties back then and buy a bunch of cans of Coke and candy bars and then sell them the period before lunch in school so I could make a few bucks. Oh, so you would compete with the oh, school? Shit. No, it wasn't really a competition because I would get to them before lunch started, so it was all mine. I love that. Everybody was hungry before lunch. And you you would do this like, oh, at at the break or something? No, like the period just before lunch. When everybody was starving. Oh, I see. That's like that book Blue Ocean Theory where it's like you just go to a market where nobody's there. But, But okay, the period before lunch, everyone's in class, right? Yeah. So you could only sell to your classmates. And the, and the people around me, everybody knew that you know I had the goods, so <laughs> they come to me just before class started. Oh, okay. And and the teachers were or were not aware of this. I don't think they cared. Some they some of them even care. bought it off me too. Wow. Okay. So <laughs> what kind of what kind of revenue was that like as a as a kid? You know, <laughs> well, it's like five to ten bucks a day. Dude. Oh, that's bad. It's all yeah. cash. Yeah. It's all cash. Deep, so. All cash. <laughs> Under the table. 50 Deep. bucks a week, man. That's pretty good. Did you sell it the same with your drug cartel? You like come in in the, in the coat and just be like, Snickers, Reese's? <laughs> now, now I know I know for a fact that you make more than $50 a week now. Um, yeah, at least I I think so. Um, but but tell tell us about the... I, I actually pay taxes now, so... <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so so maybe not. Seem. Don't, don't incriminate yourself about what you did in, in middle school. Um, or didn't do, but okay. So tell us about like the real, the real deal when you were like 19 or whatever, so, it all, when, I, when it all began. So the entrepreneurial spirit actually started thanks to my dad. He, uh, he was in the restaurant business and I grew up working since I was like literally seven years old. Uh, Mr. Pete Burgers down in San Clemente was the first restaurant that I remember. And then after that, he opened up Pedro's Tacos, which is kind of like the, the famous place that everybody knows now. And, and if you surf at all, San Clemente, Pedro's Tacos is very iconic. And it was, it was one of those things where I literally, like, I'd go to school, I'd go to volleyball practice, and then I'd immediately leave and go to the restaurant and work until 9 o'clock, close it, come back, and do my homework and, and you know, eat dinner and whatever else. He started Pedro's Tacos. Started. He's Pedro. And again, you know, Mr. Pete was the, the burger place, and Pedro's was the Mexican place. Okay. So... And that, that's where it all kind of began. And my dad had just instilled in me uh, all the necessary uh, mindsets to go beyond the borders, to go beyond that box that we all get stuck in. And he always used to, back then, Tony Robbins didn't really exist, but my dad used to listen to Tony Robbins equivalent type stuff. 
and he'd literally sit there and make me. He'd drive me around and make me listen to it in a you know cassette back then. Do you remember who that was? It was like Jim Rohn or something? No, it was some English dude with an accent. And, and in fact, when my dad passed a couple years ago, I, I found it in his briefcase still. And you know, and it just oh, wow. I've kept it, brought back memories. But it was those kind of things that created who I am today. And and my dad's, you know, instead of he did his fair share of spanking too, you know, but. As I got older, it was more about lecturing, and and you know at times it was like, well, heck, I'd rather not sit here and get lectured. It was all I'd rather just get a spanking and get it over with. But but in reality, now as a father, I'm looking back and it's like, you know what? You got to talk to your kids and you got to treat them like adults at times, and and teach them. It's teachable moments. I like that. So you've instilled a lot of the same fatherly qualities and characteristics as your dad, and then when you were. I mean, how old was it when you finally like, okay, I'm going to do my, I'm going to try and do my own thing. Yeah. So there was, there is a bunch of stuff. I mean, in between, uh, just a quick little fun story, you know, being growing up in a Greek family, you don't get paid. So you just, you expect, you're expected to work, right? It's like people get paid to do chores at home. And it's like, that's easy stuff. You don't get paid to do that. That's part of living. Working at the restaurant, you should get paid for. I was working full time and I still didn't get paid. So I'd get pissed and I'd grab bags full of burritos and I'd head down to the beach and I'd sell them and then come back and go back to work. So that's nice. that's kind of how my whole thing is, right? But then cannibalizing your your own father's business. <laughs> <laughs> well, he knew it at that point. It's like and he couldn't he couldn't say anything about it because it was a good idea. Oh, yeah. well, you got a construction oh, zone going dude. over there, man. No, now we're all clean. <laughs> you said, are you okay? And there was a trash can there. <laughs> and now it's now it's taking care of the leak over there. <laughs> <laughs> all right go on all right can we get back to my story now yeah please please so you guys then, weren't so concerned with me throwing all this shit off my desk <laughs> so then i went to cal state fullerton and uh somewhere in between i was i was introduced to this business buying used levi's off the students so i would buy used levi's from the students there on campus i just put some ads in the paper and then i would turn around and sell them to a friend of mine so can, rewind real quick. Why? Why did you do that? Wasn't there something that sparked this like idea to sell jeans? Just this this friend of mine was was in this import export business, and he met a, a Japanese guy that was buying his stuff. And this Japanese guy said, "Hey, man, I really need to use Levi's. They're really huge in Japan." And this is before the fad or the trend really started out here. So he was just like searching everywhere he could to buy used Levi's, and he found this guy in Texas that was buying him off the students over there and just killing it. So he's like, dude, why don't you do the same thing over here? So I put an ad out, started buying used Levi's, had no idea what I was looking for, you know, but there's there's literally like all these different class classes and, and then grades of each class. And Yeah, I remember watching, I think it was like a, one of those Storage Wars shows where they had like, they found like a bunch of old Levi's and it's like if the tag is red on the inside or if the original... There's the, the Big E, there's the Big E. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, there's so many like little things of the, the eras of when they were making <coughs> Levi's and, you know, it's vintage, right? Some of them are. Anyways, so I started doing that. It went really well, and it kind of started growing and growing. And then what I did is I actually set up a table on campus. They always had, like, these vendors outside. Yeah. So I set up a table for, for a week, and I don't know. I think we paid the school 50 bucks or something. At this point now, I got involved with two of my roommates, and we all did it as a group. Like So we were partners in it. And in the first day, I don't know, we barely got any, any Levi's in. The second day, barely got any Levi's. Third day, barely got any Levi's. And everybody was just like, what do you guys, what is this, you know? And by the fourth day, we bought a ridiculous amount, 500 pairs of Levi's all in one day. Wow. How much are you buying each pair for? Like between, I mean, it was between one and 10, but the average was like three bucks. And then you're turning around and selling them for how much? 15 to 15, usually on the average. But that was because we didn't have all the connections yet ourselves. So this kind of spurred the whole like thing. And we ended up, like I drove up to Melrose in Hollywood. And went to all the stores over there and said, hey, guys, I have used Levi's, and you guys are all selling them here. Uh, you know, you're interested in buying. And then all of a sudden, it went from 15 to 20 bucks. And then as we got more and more Levi's to sell, we became bigger players and then started attracting more of the, like the direct buyers from Japan. And then all of a sudden, it went up to like 25 bucks. And, and it grew, like all the asset, you know, assets, like classes grew. So women's jeans, 
uh, all the die cuts, you know, all the the weird the the girls jeans, the um, the five hundred ones, the big five hundred ones, the small five hundred ones, the faded ones, the really dark ones, and they were all like fad driven. So Japan's the one that kind of drove that fad. And for, I mean, they're all small typically, so you had to have small Levi's. And it was tough because most of the guys in America are bigger than size 28s, 29s. Right. So it's hard to get. And all of a sudden, those drove up to a $30 price range because they wanted them so bad. Right. All right. And then baggy jeans came in as style for a little bit. So, anyways, so we did that and, and it worked. So then we went and just, I barely graduated, to be honest with you, my senior year. I was in school maybe 10 or 20 percent of the time. Mm-hmm. We were literally went to Cal State Santa Bar or to uh, Cal State Long Beach, um, Los Angeles, Santa Barbara. We just hit all of the the schools. Now, how many months are, into it are you at this point? Probably like five. Five months in, and all the inventory is coming from the schools. Yeah. And how many? And pairs we're picking up th- thousands at this point. Thousands <laughs> a month, do you think? Thousands <clears throat> a week. How okay. many? How big was the crew? Three of us, and and how many pairs do you think you'd sell every month? Um, gosh, I don't know. Probably somewhere between ten to twenty thousand. Oh. And you, and you just like carry these in your car? Yeah, I mean, we were just, we were stuffing like literally, you know, we stuffed every square inch of our car, and and we'd drive them back, and they'd sit in our little three bedroom apartment in Placentia and our home was completely filled with with Levi's and it became our thing. So you guys all lived together too. We did. We were all buddies. That's and then, awesome. And then I had this bright idea of I don't want to split it three ways. So I wanted to break off and do it on my own on my own. And I had this great idea of, you know, schools, forget the schools. I, too much work. I'm gonna I'm gonna go direct and go out of just the the school zone. So I broke it off with with my friends, with my partners. And everybody was cool with it. They got more for themselves. And then I went and found this corner. Um, my gosh, it was like on Euclid and something in Fullerton. And it was uh, uh, a gas station that, that agreed to rent me the corner. And, and I'm like, it was like 200 bucks or something. I'm like, this is going to be sweet. <laughs> you know, now I'm no longer confined within these <laughs> gates of the school. It's like open to everybody. And... And I was crushed. I got, I bought like five pairs my first day, and I was like, "Oh man, I'm, I just made the be- worst decision, right?" And the second day was, I don't know, five or ten pairs. And then I remember uh, back then it was, I think it was California, or no, it was the Australian Beach Club in Orange. It was this bar, and you know, I'm 21 years old. Yeah, because <laughs> I was at a bar, so I was 21 years old. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. I could have edited it out. And this was like the hot place in town, and they had a jacuzzi inside with these gorgeous women in G-strings selling beers. And I was there drinking my beer with my friends, feeling the sadness of the bad decision I just made of breaking it off, and all of a sudden I had this brilliant idea. So I went and I talked to this beautiful girl inside this jacuzzi inside the nightclub selling me a beer and said, I'll pay you $20 an hour if you're willing to wear cowboy boots, little Levi cutoffs and a bikini top and hold a sign that says cash for used Levi's. And she said, really? And I said, yeah. She goes, okay. When? Tomorrow. Okay. So she comes out. And uh, she's holding up this sign, walking the walking the corners of, of this gas station, and all of a sudden, man, it just freaking blew up. Like it just blew up. It, I had people driving by slowly with their camera, going click, 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 taking pictures of her. People stopping to see what I'm doing. People, anyways, running that, into other cars because they're distracted. That day, I bought like a couple hundred. So I went from like practically nothing to a couple hundred. The second day. I bought, I bought uh, over a thousand, and the, one day. And the next day, I bought like fifteen hundred, all in one day. Just crushed it. Okay, so, so. rewind real quick. Um, when you were with your partners, and you guys were making a killing for like five months, how much money were you taking home at that time? You know what, dude? It was hard to say. Really hard to say, actually, because cash for used Levi's, you always needed cash to to rebuy. So even though we were making money, 
it was it was tough because we were constantly reinvesting and then we had all this inventory so, and and then you know if you've ever been in a business that holds inventory it's it's a killer like if you don't manage your inventory right it's, it's just cash it's sitting there yeah it's cash it's just sitting there so we had thousands of dollars you know at this young age but a lot of it was an inventory a lot of it was an unsellable jeans because we didn't have the right client but we still bought them because we knew oh, got it. we could sell them at one point and uh, but you know I mean we were I'm sure we were making five thousand a piece at this point five thousand a piece in each cash. month yeah in cash yeah. I mean and like- it's not like we were working every day you know I mean we were at the school for a week but then we'd take a, a week or two off until the next school started I mean for a 19 20 year old kid like you know that's sixty thousand dollars a year tax free oh yeah I mean I you know what and, and the best thing that could have ever happened to me is is to get spoiled with what money is and how how it you know what it does for you because the drive after that you just can't when everybody else is coming out of school trying to make 50 grand a year you're just thinking this is ridiculous there's no way I can even survive on this I have to I have to make more and it drives you to make more at that time you probably had most of your income was disposable though right I mean because you had this apartment you shared with two other guys a car and that's it. No, that's it. no wife, no kids, nothing. I mean, you just drop it. What, what are you spending your money on? Australian Beach Club. <laughs> <laughs> so is that it. place still open or what? <laughs> no, you saw that chick's number. In the bar? Yeah. You saw that chick's number. <laughs> yeah. So, and then what happened is, is I, I finally graduated from from college, and I had this. Um, instead of going to the street corners, right? That that I was doing. By the way, I got shut down. The city shut me down. Uh, like four days after the bikini babe, Model. yeah, <laughs> Why? was walking the street because I didn't have a permit. Yeah, the city wants their cut. Yeah, yeah, I didn't have a permit. So then I pull. I waited like two, three weeks, and I pulled. I, I actually no, I didn't pull a permit. I just did it again, <laughs> and she was literally out there within hours of me starting again. So my idea was really just like going down the tubes, and that's when I found this little teeny place in Anaheim on State College. And I went, and the owner happened to be there painting the place. It was vacant. I went and talked to him, and he rented it to me for, I think, like, 1000 bucks a month or something. And it was scary, to be honest with you. I'm signing a lease, and I'm committing 1000 bucks a month. And even though I've been making some money, it's still different, scary, you know. And and then uh, I did it. I opened it up. I put up a big sign, Cash for Use Levi's, and just blew it up from there. I was buying probably between two and 400 pairs a day consistently for for years. Um, and then within like in less than a year, I opened up my second store in Garden Grove and I added I added the jeans there that didn't have a good wholesale and started retailing them. And, and mostly it was like the, the working crew, the construction guys, a lot of the Hispanics in the area, like 10 bucks for two pairs of jeans, done. Are you buying every pair that walks through the door, or did you have criteria like, well, I can't buy these because of X, Y, or Z? Yeah, total total criteria between one and twenty dollars. Um, we never paid more than than ten typically, um, and and the majority. I think the our average price was like five bucks, and and the the jeans that we were buying for one dollar, one and three dollars, we were selling for ten dollars, and and the jeans that that we were buying for more, we were wholesaling. So we were sending them straight out, uh, and it was and it was a killer business. I mean, it was still a solo operation at this point. Solo, yeah. <clears throat> so you're doing your accounting, you're doing everything yourself, marketing. Yeah. And I guess it kind of was running itself now that people knew about it, right? The Dino Show. Yeah. So you know, it was back then it was like the Penny Saver. There was no internet or anything, so just, you advertise in the Penny Saver in all your local areas, and people were coming in like crazy. And, and selling selling stuff. And then it kind of grew a little bit from there. So all of a sudden it was like the retail piece had become a little a little something. And so back then Doc Martens were kind of popular. And I was like, well, you know, let's buy some Doc Martens. So cash for use Doc Martens. And CDs, cash for use CDs. And then we started buying some flannel shirts and various things like that. So I had kind of like this um, old you know, like U.S. vintage style, you know, shops kind of going on. And and then I expanded a little bit and went into new clothing and started selling some girls, girl clothes because the 
aside from the working class guy that was buying the jeans, there was also the young girls that wanted the jeans. And they were all of a sudden in the U.S. starting to pay top dollar. And even more, like the retail price there was a little more than what the wholesale price was. So all of a sudden, I opened one in Anaheim Hills, then one in Tustin Ranch, and then one in Fullerton. And so I had five, and uh, and it was great business. I mean, it was it was fun. And then the two, the Anaheim Hills and the Tustin Ranch location, had brand new clothing as well, where I had you know like all the surf brands. Um, at the time, Massimo was really big, oh, yeah. and then R- Rusty, Quicksilver, um, Stussy. And, uh, and now I guess that it's uh, now that it's over, I can say it like Stussy, for example, and the Japanese market was getting so huge that for certain brands, um, um, Stussy was the main one and it was an impossible brand to get, but I had gotten, I had created the like, Tustin Ranch store was a really cool store. It was a really good one. So Stussy actually like decided to sell to me and, and I had this little Japanese guy that was like my main client. And he'd literally come in, give me, like, he he knew all the new brands, all, all the new styles that were coming out, because he had a pre-order, like, six months in advance. And he'd tell me, this is what I wanted this, this is what I wanted that. I'd say, you know, I can't just buy that, because Stussy is, like, hip to it. And they, like, will not sell to you if you're reselling to the Japanese. Hmm. So so I'm like, I have to buy a lot more in order to be able to get this. He's like, I get it. And then I have to keep it in my store for a little while before I can sell I get it. So he would literally give me the money up front. I'd buy probably ten thousand plus dollars at a time of Stussy, and then put it in my store. Some people would buy it, but then he'd come in every day and buy like two, three, four pairs of stuff until he cleaned me out, and he'd buy it at full retail value. Wow! Prepaid. <clears throat> Prepaid. So at that point, now that you got a couple stores open, you're running your solo operation. What kind of money are you pulling in then? So about three hundred thousand dollars a year, all cash, all cash. And and son, I was probably twenty four, twenty five, and I had all young, pretty girls working for me, and all my clients or all my customers at those stores were all young, pretty girls, and I was in heaven. Like my life was heaven, <laughs> living the dream. So so it sounds like you, your operation would. W- is uh, what would be like a Buffalo Exchange now. Yeah, yeah. So the vintage stores were just like like Buffalo Exchange, and then the other ones were a lot more of what you would see in the mall. The other Got time. it. Okay. Got it. Okay, so then and how does the tra- – go ahead. I was going to say, how did, how did Homegirl find out that you were at a place without a permit on the corner? You're just attracting that much attention? Yeah. That somebody I mean, wanted to ruin your thunder you because got, her life was you, miserable? You got a girl with a bikini uh, in the middle of Fullerton. No, uh, she's prettier than me. Fuck that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so how does the transition take place from from uh, the jean store to what you do now? So life is full of lessons. And, um, and just before that, I had, even though I had a lot happening, that piece earlier I talked about inventory and how that's where your money sits. I didn't have that mastered just yet. So I actually hired a consultant. He came in, he kind of taught, 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 taught me, taught me, taught me a, a little bit about it. And I learned a lot, a lot. And, and it really, it relates to what budgeting is in any household or business these days. Like it's the same thing. I used to buy just whatever I possibly could because I knew I could sell it, but then I'd be sitting on inventory a lot of times. And that was on the used part, but once, and that was cool because I could always unload the used. But then the new stuff, you're buying six months in advance, and you're buying just whatever you think is well, whatever you think will sell. Some does, some doesn't. And it was a totally different ball game. And instead of buying stuff for between one and ten dollars, you're now buying them for, you know, thirty, forty, fifty dollars a piece. So your money is like sitting in one like rack of clothes you're like thinking i got 10 grand just sitting right there right you know and so he taught me a lot about that and then as i started kind of dialing all that in bam the japanese economy just melted just melted completely and my wholesale division which is really where the cash was and where all the 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 fun stuff was um evaporated overnight it just stuff I used to sell for like thirty and thirty five dollars a piece was worth like fifteen dollars, and 
it, it just all of a sudden, and then the European clientele and all the other clientele stopped buying because they knew, or I shouldn't say stopped, but they reduced their prices because they knew now the market's changed. And, and it just was different. It wasn't the same anymore. And that's when I had this bright idea after that. I started selling a bunch of the stores. I sold them to some of my old employees. Um, I closed a couple. And I got into a, like a closeout business, kind of like a roster marshals. I started buying some, uh, like a truckload of, of closeouts. And I opened up a store on uh, Beach Boulevard in Huntington just for the Christmas holiday season and killed it, did really well. Um, but, you know, I'm selling everything at this point, like diapers, luggage, Nikes, Adidas, um, underwear, you name it. It's like I had everything in this store. But it it just, the fun wasn't really there because that clientele that comes in there, it's like, it's at 99 cents. Shut the F up. Like, I'm yeah. not going to lower it anymore, yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, so it just wasn't as much fun. And even the way you're talking about that now versus 10 minutes ago when you were talking about the other thing, you could tell the fun wasn't there. Yeah. Yeah. It was different, you know? So I was like, you know what? I'm going to go into being a... A real estate agent that's where the fun is realtors yeah. are <laughs> yeah. where it's at and uh, and I started I lived on the beach in Newport um, and I, I still remember it was an El Nino year right 98. and huh? 98 98 and I was uh, I was getting my license and doing all the stuff um, I needed to do um, and my buddy who was in the same business as me had you know he, we were both in kind of the same we had employees we had this and, and and there was really nothing to do and nobody our age wasn't working everybody was always gone so him and I would hang out a lot of the times and we were stand, we were sitting in my in my condo on the beach watching the waves break on top of the Newport Pier and uh, and we're drinking we we were just drinking beers and it was like middle of the day and we we're like man as much as this is cool like. It kind of sucks. The know? Everest College commercial came on. <laughs> Make the call. <laughs> yeah. So getting to where I'm at today, um, I decided to become a real estate agent. And last, last minute, I backed out of that and got into the loan business just because I used to drive like all the time. And I was like, I don't want to drive anymore. I'm just going to sit in my office and, and, and handle it. And I decided, you know, I was in Newport at the time. And I was like, if, I, if I'm going to work anywhere, I might as well be in Newport. And if it's going to be anywhere in Newport, it might as well be Fashion Island. So I, like, fine-tuned exactly where I wanted to work. Um, got a job working for this guy over there less than a year later. Um, switched over to another company. And, gosh, I don't know, probably five years later, I bought half the company. And uh, quickly started becoming you know, better and better at what I do. And, and the way you set yourself apart is you just, you have to be better than everybody, right? And, and you have to be able to solve people's problems. And if you can solve people's problems, you'll get commitment from them and loyalty from them. And, um, and it took a while. It wasn't easy. And at this point I was actually kind of going broke because I hadn't, I hadn't sold anything in, in six months. So it took me, when I came in, it was a bit of a uh, of a downturn in the market and all of a sudden you know i was kind of hosed on that so i had this brilliant idea which i've told you about jay i think you probably wanted to me to say it how how i got my first deal um the business that like instead of going after the client that needs the loan i go after the real estate agents because they're always out there hunting for new people and heck Everybody buys buy a house, needs a loan, right? So you make friends with the real estate agents, they bring you the business, and then so on and so on. So I didn't have any business, and and I was and nobody, even my friends that were in the business, wouldn't give me any deals because their paycheck was riding on it. And why give it to the new guy when you're not sure if he's going to screw it up or not? So it was Christmas time, and I remember I got I got a yacht. Uh, we went out. For, I invited a bunch of real estate agents, and we went out for a little two hour tour. Um, on the island for the Christmas boat parade. And at the end, I thanked each and every one of them for such a great year and all the support. <laughs> Never gotten a deal from any of them. That's brilliant. <laughs> and the very next day, I got my first deal. <laughs> I love that. So, and then it just kind of escalated from there. You know, like I said earlier, you just, you, you be the best that you can. 
Um, you you solve people's problems, and you you know just like and I hate putting it this way, but right, you do this for a paycheck. So we all love our clients, and the people I know that are really good at this, they love their clients, and they'll put their paycheck aside for a little bit. But we can't fool ourselves; we're doing this for that paycheck. So. I always had the mindset of if I want a real estate agent to refer me business, not only do I have to know that I can close the deal, but shouldn't everybody be able to close the deal? Like that shouldn't even be the big thing. Right. I need to be able to close that deal faster than everybody so I can get that real estate agent their paycheck faster and I can get people into the home faster and then I'll be more special than everybody else. Mm -hmm. Speaking of being better than everybody else, you also have two podcasts. And so, you know, maybe give us some advice on how to do it. How to do yeah, it. you helped us out when we, when we first started this. I remember that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, which is how I met you guys all. I met Jay originally through the podcast when I interviewed him. It was a cocky little... Back then, it was just the radio show. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It was, it Money was Matters, a radio show. And it was on uh, 1150 AM. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I remember that. And so, okay, so here's what happens, right? I, I thrive. I do well. I make a ton of money. Um, buy a bunch of houses. I uh, get married, have two kids, and then I get divorced, and then I and then the market uh, crashes like crazy. So the majority of my investments were I had nine houses at the time, so I get divorced. Um, all nine of my houses lose, you know, well over a million dollars like overnight, and I own a mortgage company, which oh by the way is probably the shittiest business you could possibly <laughs> be in at the time. So perfect storm, right? And and then it's like you're sitting around thinking, oh, wow, now what am I going to do? And am I really going to start over? Because now all of a sudden I'm older and I have kids and I got this massive payment I got to make till, till you know, the X. And, uh, and you're like sitting there going, what am I going to do? And how am I going to do this? So at some point I got a hold of myself and I'm like, you know what? It doesn't matter what's going on out there. Somebody out there is killing it right now because they're taking advantage of the, whatever situation is, is available. I just got to be able to be have my eyes open enough to be able to see what that situation is and then be that guy. Be that guy that's going to kill it. I always have been. Be that guy. Stop sitting around trying to figure out what to do and just do it. And, and that's when I kind of changed everything I did. Uh, I was living in Corona Del Mar at the time partying all the time, having a great time. And I actually moved. I moved out of Corona Del Mar, moved down to, to uh, Mission Viejo, just so I can get away from all the distractions of, of life and, uh, and start focusing in on what matters. And, um, you know, and, and then I'm going to bring God into the picture a little bit too. So I've always believed in God, but, you know, kind of put him aside for a little bit during that, that period of time. And, and then I was like, you know what, this isn't right. It's not who I am, and i got to clean life up a little bit. So I started waking up at 4 in the morning just so I could read the Bible because I had never actually read the Bible from start to finish. And so from 4 to, like, 5.30, I would read the Bible, and then I'd go to the gym, then I'd get to the office, and then I'd come home around 7 and, you know, fall asleep around 10 or 11, wake up, do the same thing. Well, that year, my business doubled. The following year, my business doubled again. And... And it took me over two years to read the Bible because I like I really studied it. Um, but all this magical stuff started happening to me. And one could say it's God. One could say it's the fact that I was working again. One could say is that I was just focused again. But it's a combination out of all those things. And and uh, things started going right again in my life. And that's when the radio show opportunity popped up and Money Matters with Dino. And uh, it was... The intent was to talk about real estate and loans, but my industry was so compliance heavy that I had to stop like talking about it because I, you know I was getting hit from every which angle on on that. So um, so we really switched over and just started talking about money and financial planners, attorneys, CPAs, real estate agents, and stuff like that. And and it became a fun show. Like it was it was a good show. Like we I, it was in a way. A, me going through school again like it was i had received my masters but by talking to all these people you know and there's no better there's no better way to learn than actually talking to people that are in it that are doing it 
right? A lot of the professors out there in, in college that are teaching you the textbook stuff, most of them haven't even done anything, right. you know? But but talking like to guys like Wing Lamb, for example, owners of Wahoo's Fish Tacos, it's an awesome show. I learned a ton, you know? And I also learned that if you go to school and you get your master's in business and you want to start a business, you're going to have this business plan and you're going to create this whole like thing that's going to take you months to do before you can actually start executing on your job, on, on what it, on your business, because this is the right way to do things. And you talk to somebody like Wing Lamb and you ask him what he did and he's like, oh, heck, are you kidding me? We just started doing it. Like we yeah, just started right. working. Was it a corporation? <laughs> no. Was it, you know, did you have a CPA? No. Did you, it is like. Baptism just, by fire. Yeah. Just get into it. It's fire ready aim, you know, and then you clean it up yeah. and, and you work with such passion, you know, and you work with, with such, you know, like drive to succeed that you don't let the bullshit get in your way. And in my comeback years, right now, I'm a little bit older and all this stuff. It was, I, I kind of say the same thing. It was the market sucked and I didn't. I wanted to get back to a place like I was when I was in my 20s where I didn't know the difference between right and wrong, so I just did it, right? If it doesn't work, you stop doing it. But don't don't overthink something. Just right. do it. And there's times where it's like, I don't even know if it worked or it didn't, but I'm doing great, so I'm not going to stop. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever's yeah, working is working. It's yeah. actually really good advice, and I think that we come across that a lot, not just like in real estate, especially in real estate, but every industry where people are like, Gotta, gotta go get my business license. Then I gotta like start a corporation. Then I gotta like build my website. And you're like, no, dude. Like, just just go do it. Like, be go make some money first and be successful at it, and then like start taking care of things that need to be taken care of. But I think it's just a, a way to justify procrastination anyway. So you know? with that said, where do you think the balance between preparation and execution should come? You know what I mean? It's like execute and then figure it out execute fucking fail miserably I think preparation's overrated i mean to be honest like the like you said earlier the best experience you'll ever get is just hands-on by doing it <clears throat> so to to a large extent by just doing it like you'll figure everything else out like how much can you prepare for something you've never done if you're adaptable though you know i think that's the way to go like do it first but then adapt to it because if you're hard-headed and you're not going to learn from your mistakes then i think you're doomed then you're an employee. Right. <laughs> you know, I'll give an example going back to my dad again, Pedro's Tacos. It, it's, I mean, most people have heard of it, at least in Orange County. And originally, it was a little burger joint. It was called Oh Boy Burgers, and it was 39 cent hamburgers, 49 cent cheeseburgers. And, and that was his bright idea. And it was great. And he made, he's made his money off the French fries and the drinks. And then we were right next to 7-Eleven. 7-Eleven open starts selling the Big Gulp for like 49 cents or whatever it was. Killed us. And then my dad's sitting there going, this is a stupid idea. And he could have just kept going or, you know, he could change it. Yeah. And midstream, he just changed it. Closed the whole thing down, put up a new sign and said, Mexican. Beans. Beans are cheap. Yeah. Let's do Mexican food. And, and I still remember Which came. he used to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I still remember he used to go to like Mexican restaurants down in San Diego. I think it was Roberto's at the time, and like watch through the window because he didn't know anything about Mexican food, and and he thought he knew what he was doing. He opens up and and uh, and he had no idea. And this little Mexican surfer kid comes in and he's like, you know, this isn't really a carne asada burrito. And my dad's like, why? And he goes, well, carne asada steak. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, oh. <laughs> so, so we cleaned it all up. And, you know, the food was good because we're Greek. And, and my mom was in there with Greek oregano and lemon and everything else that Greeks cook with. And, you know, and, all, and it's funny because all the advice my dad got was like, oh, it's Mexican food. Just come up with the really good salsa. Don't worry about the quality of the meat or the quality of the beans. Just put in some good salsa. Nobody will know the difference. And, and my dad just couldn't do that. He was like, no, I'm not going right. to give poor, you know, anything. So he was constantly working on the quality of the food. And then the other piece is like, he's like, it's fast food. If you can't get this thing out in a few minutes, then why are people coming here? They're going to go to a restaurant, not fast food restaurant, mm -hmm. right? So same thing with everything we do. We, we in the preparation, you know, versus execution, you just, sometimes you just got to go. And, you know, now if you're already beyond that point and you have a ton of money and you can 
hire the right people to do the proper, you know, investigation on everything and know how to put everything together and you're investing millions, then maybe so. But if you're starting a new business, whether it's a real estate agent or a tanning salon like Jenny uh, or a, a, a bronze bunny, whatever it is, um, you just do it, yeah. you know, and then you figure it out. And if you have the drive, you'll figure it out. I think it's really good advice. And the takeaways that, that I got out of that is like just execution over anything else and be better than your competition at all times. I mean, yeah. that's like a recipe for success. It's not hard. And, you know, like Jay, for example, with you, when we first met, you know, you were still fairly new in the business, but you had this passion, right? And you always were picking my brain about little things. And right then and there, I knew like you were going to make it. And I knew I liked you. I was like, this dude is trying to be better than everybody else. He's trying to to do things the way all these other realtors aren't doing them. And that that's basically what it's going to be. If you want to succeed, now, it's not for everybody. Not everybody should be self-employed. Not everybody is an entrepreneur. Right. There's a lot of real estate agents that have no business being a real estate agent because being a real estate agent, let's not kid yourself, you, it's being an entrepreneur. Nobody's holding your hand. Nobody's giving you a steady paycheck. Right. So <clears throat> let's, um, as we wrap up here, let's plug both of your podcasts. One of them is called God's Men of Influence, yep. where, where essentially you're interviewing um, Christian individuals who are also successful or have a success story of some kind, right? So, yeah, so let's start with Money Matters with Dino, right? That was the one that, the first one that started it all, and it's it's kind of a business podcast. A lot of it with money, a lot of it, a lot of financial planning type stuff. Um, and it's, again, Money Matters with Dino, the website is moneymatterswithdino.com. Um, and as good as, it's been around now for probably four years. Um, I don't pay as much attention to it as I should because the new passion is God's Men of Influence, and it's part of my passion of God now. And it's my way of kind of giving back. So I interview male Christians. And, and I shouldn't say it's like a success story, right? Because it's not a business podcast. It's, a, it's man's testimony. And I believe man's testimony is extremely valuable. It's like reading you know, an autobiography on somebody. You can learn from people. And I don't care if you're a janitor or the CEO of a company. You have life experience in you that is, is going to be valuable to somebody. And and it's godsmenofinfluence.org. Um, it's also you know everything's on iTunes and SoundCloud as well. But that's a really great show because I've talked to CEOs that that used to be alcoholics um, that used to have all sorts of issues and have now overcome it and are where they are. I talked to a guy just recently that killed somebody in the old days. He was part of you know a, a biker gang and. Went to jail and dropped to his knees and, you know, finally kind of like figured it out, came back. And now he's helping thousands of people. Um, there's another another guy that we all know, Derek Ram. And he, oh, was, he was a drug addict. He was bad, you know. And then <clears> I asked him, did you, what was what, when you quit? Like, what was the big wake up call? What was the epiphany? He's like, well, Dino, I had a few of them. Unfortunately, I didn't really learn. The first one was when I woke up at Hogue Hospital from a drug overdose, and all my family and friends were there, and they were like, what in the heck happened? You know, like his family had no idea he was even hooked on drugs. Yeah, I listened to that one, I remember. Remember? And then the, mm -hmm. and then he, and I, and he said, but unfortunately, that wasn't my wake-up call. Second time, though, when I woke up at Hogue Hospital and nobody was there, that was my wake-up call. Burned yeah. every bridge, you know? So... So the podcast, in my eyes, is is amazing, and it's doing unreal numbers. We've we've blasted through a hundred thousand downloads now, so it's all over the world, um, including like Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and, hmm. and, and, and India and Philippines, and it's all over the place. And it's really cool because man's testimony is extremely powerful, and whether it's business related, addiction related. You know, marriage problems, kid problems, whatever it is, we got a little piece of it all for everybody. I love it. So, okay, that's Money Matters with Dino and God's Men of Influence. Those are the two podcasts. And then for mortgages, home loans, refis, citywide home loans. Citywide home loans. And uh, and my branch is in Newport Beach, right across from the airport on MacArthur. And I'm looking, I'm now, the recently I became the new area manager for Citywide. So my goal is to grow out Orange County. Uh, open up new branches within Orange County, 
hire new loan officers. So I definitely, definitely need some new loan officers. And uh, for any branch managers that already have a branch that want a good place to work with uh, a lot of great things, it's a good family that we're in, uh, you know, give me a call. So I will, uh, I'll just add to that real quick. Um, you're our very first mortgage person ever on the show. We're almost at 60 episodes now. You're, we try not to bleed into the industry too much and, and promote things that are kind of siloing a little bit. But um, I gotta say, I Dino's the kind of guy that I, I trust implicitly. He handles um, the majority of the business that comes in and out of Remax Prestige, and and you're in good hands if you uh, if you go to Dino, whether you're gonna get a loan or if you're gonna go work for him. Do you need someone to stand on the corner with a sign? I noticed you've been working out lately. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's it. Dino, thank you so much for being on the show. Sincerely appreciate it, man. Yeah, thank man. you. Thanks, Thanks you guys. I appreciate it. Cue the music. If you would like to be on the Prestige Living Podcast or know someone that would be a great guest, go to www.prestigelivingpodcast.com. We'd love to hear your story. 